this land In the hearts of men In the orphan child In our government In our hurt and heartache In the poor and weak In our daily toils In the things we see Let your kingdom come
needed rescue, my sin was heavy The chains break at the weight of your glory I needed shelter, I was an orphan But you call me a citizen of heaven Our hearts will cry 
these bones will sing Great are you Lord yes. So the earth will shout your praise Our hearts will cry These bones will sing
Hi everyone and Merry Christmas. Uh, some of you have been doing the Christmas challenge with us in which we are reading a chapter. We have been reading a chapter a day from the Gospel of Luke starting in, on December 1 all the way through to December 24, the 24 chapters of Luke's Gospel. And we've been sort of uh, preaching about Luke's Gospel and we've seen that Luke presents a journey, uh, a new exodus if you will, uh, led by Jesus, the, the prophet like Moses. And uh, the, we, we spoke about other aspects of the journey, but today we're going to speak on, on uh, as appropriate for, for Christmas Day, we're going to speak on the start of the journey. And the start of the journey is Jesus' journey from heaven to earth, his journey into humanity, or as it's commonly called in Christianity, the incarnation. And um, it addresses an issue or a problem that humanity has identified and tried to solve throughout human history. And that problem is, how do we get to God? How do we reach God? And the answer that the Bible gives and that Christianity gives turns the answer that every other religion gives on its head. Because every other religion says we get to God by being good enough or by attaining a certain standard. And Christianity, the gospel, turns it completely on its head and says, we cannot get to God. God gets to us. <laughs> we don't find God. God finds us. We don't reach God. God reaches us. And the incarnation is the epitome of, of that journey that God takes to come to us. It's, it's Jesus' journey into humanity. So I'm not going to read the first two chapters of, of, of Luke. But I, I just want to sort of maybe give a little bit of a summary of it. 
um, in the way that Luke presents it. Because the first two chapters of Luke, if you look carefully, you'll see, um, in, in fact, it stretches into the third chapter as well, but you'll see that, that Luke intentionally presents a parallel where he compares and contrasts John the Baptist on the one hand and Jesus of Nazareth on the other hand. And we see a, a few things in, in that parallel. The, the first thing that we see is both of their births are announced by the angel Gabriel. Uh, let me just read a few verses there. Um, in Luke 1 verse 11, it says, The angel of the Lord appeared to him, that's to Zechariah, standing at the right hand side of the altar of incense when Zechariah who was John the Baptist's father saw him he was startled and was gripped with fear but the angel said to him do not be afraid Zechariah your prayer has been heard your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you will call uh, and, and you are to call him John he will be a joy and delight to you and many will rejoice because of his birth for he will be great in the sight of the Lord he is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah and to turn the hearts of the parents to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I'm an uh, old man and my wife is well along in years. And then the angel answers in verse 19. You can hear a bit of offense in the angel's voice if you listen carefully. It, you can sort of almost see him straightening his back, you know, and like, what do you question me? The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words, which will come true or which will be fulfilled at the appointed time. And we saw um, in previous um, messages that the whole theme of fulfillment is very prominent and that our responsibility as God's people is to believe in that fulfillment, that God would fulfill uh, his promises, that they will come true in the appointed time. But um, just a few things I want you to notice here. Gabriel comes and announces the birth of John. He gives the name that Zechariah should give to his son, John. Um, and then um, there's, you know, the assurance that what he has predicted, what he has prophesied will be fulfilled. And like I said, he, he, you know, when, when John questions this and says, listen, I'm, I'm old, dude. I don't know if you angels don't know human biology, but when we pass a certain age, no more children. You know, my wife's old, I'm old. We're past childbearing age, not going to happen. And, and, you know, you almost pick up that Gabriel is a bit offended. But we, when you read carefully, you see he's not offended because Je Zechariah is questioning his word. He says, um, I stand, I'm Gabriel, I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you. I was the word that I'm speaking to you is a word that I've been given and sent to take to you. In other words, you're not questioning my word, you're questioning God's word. And God's word will come true. It will be fulfilled in the appointed time. Um, Anyway, we know the story, you know, Zechariah cannot speak until the day actually his son, um, John, is born. And then he insists that his name should be John. And then all of a sudden his mouth opens and he can speak again. Now, um, you know, in, in contrast to that, um, the same Gabriel comes uh, to Mary um, and in, in, in Luke 1 verse 28, it says, The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. And Mary was greatly troubled at, this, uh, at his words and wondered what kind of a greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. So same Gabriel announcing it. 
also the name is given Jesus, um, as John's name was given, he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. So where John was said he will be great uh, in the sight of the Lord, Jesus will be even greater in the sight of the Lord. Um, he will be called the Son of the Most High. He won't just be a great prophet. Uh, he'll be the Son of the Most High. How can this be? Mary asked the angel. For, since I am a virgin, the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month month for no word from god will ever fail it will always be fulfilled god's word will always be fulfilled heaven and earth will pass away but god's word will never pass away it will never fail and then in in verse 38 um, i am the lord's servant mary answered may your word to me be fulfilled and, and, you know, just one, one thing that Luke does here is he contrasts Zechariah and Mary and says, we should, when the word of the Lord comes to us, we must respond like Mary, not like Zechariah. We must respond in faith and obedience and say, let, let your word to me, may your word to me be, be fulfilled. May it happen to me according to your word. Um, not doubting it like Zechariah did. And I think that's a, a challenge we all, we all face. Um, as the word of the Lord comes to us, how are we going to respond? But we see here that there's a parallel between John's, the announcement, John's birth foretold by, by Gabriel and, and Jesus' birth foretold by Gabriel. Then Mary goes and she meets Elizabeth, her relative. Um, and and when, when, when Mary greets Elizabeth, John kicks in the womb. He's only six months old, you know in the womb and, and he kicks in the womb because he's filled with the Holy Spirit even before birth and then we see there's a song that Mary sings a, a powerful prophetic hymn and in the next uh, at the end of the chapter there's a powerful prophetic hymn once Zechariah's mouth is opened uh, and and what the angel said is fulfilled he also sings a very powerful prophetic hymn so there's a parallel as well you know between their parents singing this prophetic hymn um, and in between we have the birth of John the Baptist He's born, and then in the beginning of chapter 2, we have Jesus who is born. And John the Baptist's birth is obviously miraculous because his, his parents were old. They, they were well past childbearing age. Um, but Jesus' birth is even more miraculous. His mother Mary was engaged or betrothed to Joseph. Um, but Joseph wasn't his biological father because Mary was still a virgin. As she said to the angel, you know, it's... This is impossible, you know. Um, I'm, I'm a virgin. I've, I've, I've never had sexual intercourse, you know. So, so John's birth is miraculous because his parents are old and past childbearing age. But, but Jesus' birth is even more miraculous because he has no biological father. That's why he's called the Son of the Most High. Um, and it's, it's a birth that has never had any parallel in human history. Uh, you, you go and look at Muhammad, you go and look at Buddha, you go and look at Krishna, you go and look at every um, founder of every earthly religion, and you'll see they have a biologi biological father. And Jesus is unique in this. He has no biological father. Um, he only had a biological mother. And the Holy Spirit um, impregnated her. Um, and then we see... Um, in, in, in the middle of chapter 1, like I said, um, John the Baptist is born and is presented at his father's house when his father names him. And then in chapter 2, from verse 22, Jesus is presented at his father's house, the temple. Um, and there are all kinds of um, interesting things that, that happen there. And I just want to read one of them uh, to you, just as sort of representative. And that's where Simeon, an, a very old man, a, a prophet, was told by the Lord that he would not die until he saw the Messiah being born. And we read in, in Luke 2, from verse 25 to 35, Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. That's language out of Isaiah 40. 
uh, talking about um, where God says to, to the prophet, you know, console my people Israel. And, and John the Baptist's ministry, the voice crying out in the wilderness, and, and Jesus' ministry, um, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, etc. Both come from that section of Isaiah that talks about the consolation of Israel. So you can see that, that, that theme of the fulfillment of God's word and of the prophetic word coming through strongly. And, and, and Simeon was waiting for that, for that fulfillment. That's why it says he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents uh, brought in the child Jesus... To do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And the child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to, be, to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. In other words, there, there, ultimately there will be great sadness. Uh, in, in, in Jesus' life and in Mary's life because of, of Jesus and because of what's going to happen to him. And what we see, like I said, is we see there's a journey. The journey of Jesus into humanity. The journey of Jesus from heaven to earth. And, and just a few things that we, that we see in, in, in this journey. Um, this journey... You see, God has to come to us. I, I, was, I was thinking as I was preparing of this, of, of one of my favorite essays by C.S. Lewis. Um, and in the essay, uh, he says about the reaching, he talks, he's talking about reaching God. I'm far less rel uh, reliable guide. Uh, this is because I never had the experience of looking for God. It was the other way around. He was the hunter. Or so it seemed to me, and I was the deer. He stalked me like, like a, a redskin and took unerring aim and fired. And I am very thankful uh, that is how, it, uh, how the first conscious meeting occurred. It forewarns one against the subsequent fear that the whole thing was only wish fulfillment. Something one did not wish for can hardly be that. And what... The incarnation, the story of Jesus' birth tells us is, number one, we don't really come to God. God comes to us. We don't really find God. God finds us. And any distance that you have to travel to get to God pales in comparison to the distance that God had to travel to get to you. We, we, we sometimes, it feels to us like we've discovered Jesus, or we've discovered God, or we've found Jesus. But when we look at it carefully, like C.S. Lewis, we found, find that he was the hunter and we were the hunted. We were the lost. And he was the one who found us. And... That's so encouraging. You know, it shows us just God's immense love for us. And, and I just want to encourage you on, on this Christmas day to be encouraged by the fact that God loves you so much that he came vast distances to find you, to be with you. Um, in that same essay called The Seeing Eye, C.S. Lewis, um, let me actually just read you a few portions from it because I find it very um, instructing and very encouraging. Um, he says, the Russians, I'm told, reported that they have not found God in outer space. This is just after Yuri Gagar and the, the Russian cosmonaut was the first um, person, first human to, to you know, exit the, the atmosphere and, and go into space. 
Uh, on the other hand, a good many, uh, C.S. Lewis continues, on the other hand, a good many people in many different times and countries claim to have found God and or be found, being found by him here on earth. Um, and he sort of, um, you know, because he's himself, a, a, he was an atheist who converted to Christianity at a late age um, in his life. Uh, he sort of understands where the Russians are coming, the Russian, you know, who, who sort of institutionalized atheism um, and com in the communist uh, regime, uh, where they're coming from. And he's sort of joking a little bit with it. Uh, and now he sort of responds to it. He, he says, looking for God or heaven by exploring space is like reading, um, you know, or seeing all Shakespeare's plays in the hope that you will find Shakespeare as one of the characters, or Stratford, that's Stratford on Avon where Shakespeare lived, as one of the places. Shakespeare is in one sense present in every moment in every play, but he is never present in the same way as Falstaff or Lady Macbeth, uh, or Romeo and Juliet for that matter. Nor is he diffused through the play like a gas. If there were an idiot who thought plays existed on their own without an author, uh, not to mention actors, producers, managers, stagehands, and uh, whatnot, our belief in Shakespeare would not be much affected by his saying quite truly that he has studied all the plays and never found Shakespeare in any of them. The rest of us, in varying degrees, according to our perceptiveness, found Shakespeare in the plays. But it is quite a different sort of finding from anything our poor friend has in mind. Even he has in reality been in some way affected by Shakespeare, but without knowing it, he lacked the necessary apparatus for detecting Shakespeare in his plays. Um, you know, and, and we often do that with God, don't we? I, I can't remember one author, um, it, it might actually have been C.S. Lewis himself in another place, says that he's amazed that God, who is so big, can go incognito because he's, he's everywhere, that he's, that he's so immense and that we can yet miss him. It's, 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 like, it's like if you asked, if you could ask a fish about water, the fish would probably say, what? Water? What's that? <laughs> Even though it swims in water and breathes in the water every day, but something that is so close to you, often you tend to miss because it's so close to you and so, inter, uh, so necessary for your life. And we often do that with God. And then Lewis goes on and says, Now, of course, this is only an analogy. I'm not suggesting at all that the existence of God is as easily established as the existence of Shakespeare. My point is that if God does exist, he's related to the universe more as an author is related to a play than as one object in the universe is related to to another. If God created the universe, he created space-time, which is the universe uh, to the universe as meter is to a poem, or the key is to a, a piece of music. To look for him as one item within the framework he himself invented is nonsensical. Um, and then, then he goes on to say, but some of you might protest and say, but hang on, you know, isn't that exactly what happened? Didn't God actually become an item in the universe he created? And then, and then he says, yes, exactly. Uh, and that's what makes Christianity such a, a, a powerful, true story, is because the author loved the characters he created, if we're using Lewis's analogy, so much that he wrote himself into the play to come and meet those characters, introduce himself to those characters, and save those characters in the play. Uh, I, I once heard that um, Dorothy Sayers, um, the well-known um, author, did something similar. I think she was a British author as well, like C.S. Lewis. Um, and she wrote a, a series of crime novels uh, that had uh, Lord Peter Wimsey as the main character. And she, she wrote a whole bunch of, of novels. And um, eventually, it is said, she, she in a sense fell in love with this character because she, uh, towards the end, wrote a new character in, um, a woman who paralleled her life 
very closely was also the first um, female graduate, I, I can never remember who it was, from Oxford or Shakespeare, uh, from, from Cambridge or Oxford. I think it was from Cambridge. And, and it just paralleled Sayer's own life in many different ways. And she wrote this character who, was, who most critics agree was basically the fictionalized version of Dorothy Sayers herself into the Lord Peter Wimsey stories. And she eventually, um, because he was, you know, he was this lonely, in some ways, tragic character, you know, and she wanted to comfort him. So she wrote herself into the story um, and they fell in love and eventually got married and lived happily ever after. And that's exactly what God in Jesus Christ did with us. He wrote himself into his own play, metaphorically speaking. He made himself part of his own creation. Why? Because he saw our tragic circumstances, how lonely we were, how broken we were. So, and he loved us and had compassion on us. He wrote himself into the play to come and introduce himself to us and to come and save us from our suffering. And that is what Christmas is all about. Christmas is all about how much God loved us and how far he was willing to go, how far he was willing to travel to introduce himself to us. The extent that he was willing to go to, to meet us, to find us and to save us. And that makes Christianity the most beautiful story ever told. Um, and what makes it even more beautiful and really makes it good news is that it's not just a, a, a fictional story. It's a true story. It's news. It's something that really did happen. And just to end off with, I want to just quickly jump back to that last passage I read about Simeon. Um, because Luke is giving us a little secret here. Notice what he says. He says, now there was in there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, and he was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. You know, he, he, he was living a life that, that aimed to please God. He was waiting and therefore, by implication, trusting in the, for the fulfillment of God's promises. And then it says, and the Holy Spirit was on him. He had been, it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. And then it says again, and moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts and there he found Jesus and recognized him. And those of you who've read Luke with us will, will have noticed how strong the theme of the Holy Spirit runs throughout Luke's gospel. Much, much more prominent, the Holy Spirit is much more prominent in Luke's gospel than he is, for instance, in Mark or even Matthew. Um, and the secret that Luke is revealing to us by telling us that story is that the key to recognizing Jesus for who he really is, the promised Messiah, in other words, the promised anointed king who has come to rule the world and save the world, the key to recognizing him is waiting for God's promises to be fulfilled and being filled ourselves with the Holy Spirit like Simeon was and being led by the Holy Spirit. And some of you have been led by the Holy Spirit to click on these links because God's Holy Spirit is organizing a meeting, an introduction with Jesus for you. Like he has led Simeon, he is leading you to Jesus. Because Jesus has come a long way to meet you. He has traveled you know, a journey from heaven to earth to come and meet you. To be introduced to you. To reveal himself to you. To love on you and to save you. Um, and I just want you to realize that wherever you are in your journey of discovering Jesus. The good news is that Jesus has come a lot further to meet you than you have come to meet him. And God's Holy Spirit is constantly working behind the scene and in your, the scenes and in your heart to lead you to Jesus and to, to open your eyes so you can see Jesus for who he really is. And that is what he's doing right now. He's revealing to you that Jesus is maybe much more than you thought him to be. 
He's not just the main character in the New Testament Bible stories. He's not just a, a character, you know, a baby in a manger, uh, a normal baby in a manger. He's the son of the living God. He's God himself come in the flesh to meet you. He's the ultimate solution to the human problem of oppression and sin and brokenness and disease and everything. Um, but the only way you can recognize him as such is if, like Simeon, you have the Holy Spirit. So I want you, I'm going to pray for us now, and I want you to do with me, just ask the Lord and say, Holy Spirit, open up my eyes so I can see Jesus for He really is and realize that He's much more than I thought Him to be. Father, we thank You, Lord, that You sent Your Son, Jesus. Thank You, Jesus, that You were willing to come so far from heaven to earth to make that journey, Lord, to come and meet us, to come and reveal yourself to us and to come and save us and love on us. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are constantly working in our hearts to open our eyes to see who Jesus really is, to know Jesus for who he really is. And Lord, we, I just pray, Lord, that all of our hearts will be opened up to know the truth of who Jesus is. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you'll help us to be able to see past, Lord, all the lies all the propaganda, Lord, all the misrepresentations of Jesus, Lord, even, even sometimes by, by us, the church, Lord, and, and, and by Christians, Lord, that we'll see past that, Lord, and see, Lord, in your word and through your spirit who Jesus really is, and that, that we'll, like Simeon, Lord, rejoice in who you are, Lord Jesus, and praise you for who you are. And Lord, we, we pray, Lord, that you'll help us, Lord, when we receive your word like Zechariah and, and Mary did, that we'll respond, Lord, not with doubt like Zechariah, but with faith like Mary and say, let it be unto me according to your word. Let your word and what you have said about me be fulfilled. And Lord, we, we just open up our hearts to your word and, and we say, Yes, Jesus, we acknowledge you for who you are. You truly are the son of God. You are the son of David. You are the son of Abraham. You are the savior of the world. We see you for who you are in Jesus' name. Amen.